If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn to the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus. It's the story of Moses. And Cindy is correct. You could do a whole summer series on Moses. We're going to try and get glean one thing from Moses this morning, and that is the faith that he had for God to lead him. We could have talked about Moses' miraculous birth, could have talked about him being hidden in the bulrushes, could have talked about the edict of Pharaoh to kill all the babies, and how, how ironic it was that God would have Moses grow up in Pharaoh's house because Pharaoh's daughter is the one who found him in the bulrushes. We're not going to talk about that. We could talk about the ten plagues that, uh, that Moses uh, administered to Egypt in order to allow God's people to be set free, but we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to talk about his death and uh, the miraculous thing that happened uh, at his death and that scripture teaches that God buried him and uh, had him go up on the mountain to look over into the promised land that he would never get to set his foot into after bringing all the people there. But uh, God had a better thing in store for him. But this morning, we're going to look as an overview and look at a few things in a message entitled, Moses, Faith in God Who Knows the Way. And so if you'd stand with me, we're going to read a couple of verses from Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3 is God's call to Moses. He calls him from a burning bush, speaks to him by name, tells him, Moses, you are the one I am calling to go and get my people out of Egypt. Some million plus people in Egypt that are in slavery, and God is going to take them out of slavery, and he's going to use one man by the name of Moses to do it. And so here he calls him from this burning bush. And it wouldn't be surprising that Moses is a little reluctant. Verse 11, but, God, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. You may be seated. We begin our journey and we'll end our journey at the same mountain. It is called Mount Sinai. It is a place where God has first made a promise. I'm going to use four P words today, and all of them are going to point towards the direction we're going to go to. And the first one is the promise of God. He doesn't say, Moses, go get my people without indeed giving him a promise. And the promise is this, I will be with you. I will be with you. He not only gives him a promise, but the promise comes with a sign, as it would. And he says, not only will I be with you, but here's the sign that I'm going to give you. When you get done bringing my people out, and Moses, you are going to bring them out. When you get done bringing them out of Egypt, you're going to bring them all the way back here to Mount Sinai, where you together with them will worship me. Look at this, and I want to point out one word for you. This is the second part of the verse 12. When you have brought the people out of Israel, or out of Egypt rather, you, maybe yours has a little asterisk beside it, will worship God on this mountain. That you is plural. In, me, in other words, all of you are going to 
or if you're from the south, y'all are going to come and worship me at this mountain. If you move to a new town, which would you rather have? Would you rather have a map to tell you how to get to the places that you didn't know how to get? Or would you rather have a neighbor who came over and said, hey, I'll show you where to go. If you needed three screws at Ace Hardware, would you rather go in and one of the guys with the red vest say, hey, it's over in aisle number 11. And you go over and you see all these drawers of screws that you have no idea where your screw is that you need. Or would you rather have the guy in the red vest come over and show you exactly where your screws are? I think I would rather have somebody personally go with me, wouldn't you? First thing is it's a promise. He said, I'm gonna be with you, Moses. The second thing that he has in this, another P word, is presence. He says, not only am I going to be with you, I am going to be present with you. I'm going to show you my presence as I go. And he does so in an odd way. We need to turn ahead a few, few chapters to chapter 13. Because Moses goes to Pharaoh. He does the ten plagues. The plagues do their work. Pharaoh lets the million plus Israelites go, Jewish people go, haven't made it to Israel yet, not even in Israel yet. But when he gets all done and they get ready to leave, he makes this, this statement to him. Look at it, it's in chapter 13, verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though it was shorter. For God said, if they faced war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around the desert road toward the Red Sea, and Israelites went up out of Egypt armed for battle. Look at verse 20. And after leaving Sukkoth, they camped at Etham, on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Verse 22, neither the pillar nor the cloud by day or near the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. In other words, here's a presence of God that is continual. It is going on and on. And it is a pillar of cloud. Listen to one Old Testament scholar write about this. Indeed, there is only one pillar. But the fire burning in the cloud becomes visible only during the evening and on on and in this way remains a constant reminder of God's presence to the people. A cloud like, a, like smoke serves well to represent God's presence and as well we see also his glory. Because though it is visible, a cloud also obscures one's vision. People cannot see in it or through it. Thus the cloud provides a sense of mystery and indirectness in the experience of God's presence. The presence of God in the cloud protecting the people from a lethal dose of God's glory. I don't know what a pillar of cloud looks like. I can imagine if you Google it and look at images of pillar of cloud, it was a large cloud, some would say, a large cloud that would go up in front of the people. The scripture tells us that it protect the people from the sun in the daytime. They're walking through the desert. And wherever that pillar went in the daytime, they followed it. And wherever it went at night, when it became not only a, a pillar of cloud by day, but now it became an illuminating cloud at night, they followed it. And when it stopped, they stopped. God was leading. God was guiding. God was directing. 
Now, today is uh, first Sunday of the month, and we don't have children's church, so I thought I would, I would involve the children in today. So all the children, if you'd come up here with me just a second. Because we want to talk about how God leads the children of Israel. <laughs> all right. You're special. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> you're going you're gonna to follow me, okay? Kevin, over here, follow me. All right. We're going to stop right here because I want to tell you about this place. This is a place where Clarence Weaver used to sit. Clarence went home to be with the Lord not too long ago. He loved this special kind of candy. And there is a little bit of candy in that bowl for anybody who would like it. You'd like to get a piece of candy? There's a piece of candy from a man of God who's home with God now. All right, come this way. There's a different view of people back here, isn't there? Wow. All right. This is Ron Bowman. He's going to give you all a high five. God has brought Ron and Joanna here. All right. And they're here to, uh, to serve God because God has brought them here. Come this way. Come this way. We'll be back in a minute. show them, you would direct them, you would guide them because you love them, right? You would do things for them to show them that they could trust you and that you were looking out for their best interests because you love them. You know what? That's the way we ought to be. That's what we ought to be to our Heavenly Father. Sometimes we're not that way. Sometimes we're more like, if I were to ask you to do me a favor after service, hey, would you do me a favor after service? And you come up to me and say, hey, what is it? Tell me what it is. See, you want to know what it is before you would agree to do it. And that's all right between you and me, but it's never all right with God. God doesn't care whether or not you want to first see what it is and then you he just says, this is the way that I will be. And you are following me. It's a 
different distance. It's a different way of following God. And here they are following him to the desert. And he did provide for them. He provided for them the, the water that they needed. He provided water from the rock. He found a pool that was bitter and they tossed in some wood and it became water that was good. He provided for them food in the desert. Manna from heaven, red light substance that would come every morning and provide them the substance they needed. And in fact, he says, don't gather more than you need for a day. And some of them did at the beginning, and it brought it in their tents. And he did that because he wanted to teach them, you can trust me each and every day. You don't have to store up for yourselves. I'm going to provide you. And when they got tired of bread coming from heaven every morning, he provided them with quail that flew in, flew in head high. They could grab it and eat it. It was great. He was providing for them over and over and over again. He protected them from Pharaoh's army who would come and try and them. And they found out that when God was leading, they were protected. But the third P word is a problem. Because they make it all the way back to Mount Sinai. They make the whole route. Moses going from Mount Sinai over to Egypt to see Pharaoh to bring all the people back. They make it all the way back. And Moses goes up on the mountain of God. And you know why he went up there, and I know why he went up there. He went up there to get the Ten Commandments, right? He went up there to get the law of God. He was gone for a long time, 40 days. Turn with me, if you would, over to chapter 19. says it, I'll decide whether I'm going to do it, and that is exactly what they said. God tells Moses, hey, if you'll just obey, I've already brought you along. I have brought you to this place. I've carried you along. 
like on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now just obey me fully and keep my covenant. And then you will, of all the nations will be my treasure possession. But when Moses goes up on the mountain, you remember what happens. The people below begin to wonder, where is Moses? So they fashioned themselves a golden calf. They bring all their gold together. They melt, they melt it down, and they make themselves a calf. They need something to be able to see, something to be able to worship. So they come and they gather around this calf. And they're in revelry and they love it. But turn with me, if you would, to chapter 33. down the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, and they were inscribed on both sides, front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablet. Let me just tell you, that is the beginning of God's word if you have your life. The beginning of God's word started with the finger of God writing upon the tablets that they would put in the ark of then on, they would carry that ark with them on poles in this place, uh, in this ark, and they would add to it what God would say to them over and over again throughout their time of, of wandering. When Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting, he said to Moses, this is the sound of war in the camp. And Moses replied, it's not the sound of victory. It's, uh, it is not the sound of victory. It is not the sound of defeat. It is the sound of singing that I hear. And when Moses approached the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing, and his anger burned, and he threw the tablets out of his hand, breaking them into pieces at the foot of the mountain. Wow, what a picture. Here they are reveling and partying in front of a golden calf, and here comes Moses at that exact moment. He sees them and he takes the tablets, the word of God for the people. You see, God loves us enough. He doesn't just want us to follow him. He gives us words of how to follow him. He didn't say, hey, this is what I want from you. He tells them, this is exactly what I want from you. And he gives them the law. He gives them the, the commandments that he has. And they throw them, he throws them, Moses throws them down at the feet, or the foot of the, of the hill, and it breaks shadows. Look at chapter 33. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place. You and the people you brought up out of Egypt, go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. And when the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn, and no one put on ornaments. Here's the picture. He has for three months led them day in and day out to the place where he wanted them to go to give them his word. And they rebelled against him. They rebelled against his word. And when, when God comes to Moses, he says, just take them and go. Go. I promised this to Abraham and Isaac and to Jacob. I promised this land and I'm going to give it to them, but I'm not going with you. Because if I go with you, I may get angry on the way and destroy all of them. He says, instead, I'll send an angel. And that angel will drive them out, drive them out so they can enter into the promised land. But I'm not going with you anymore. And Moses intercedes on the people. He intercedes for them before a holy God. And in doing so, he understands that, hey, I don't want to go from this place. I don't want an angel 
to lead us. You know, if they were to left then, they would not have had the commandments with them because they were smashed and Moses had to come back up on the hill a second time. They wouldn't have the tabernacle built because the tabernacle hadn't been constructed yet. The design had been given on the, ha on the mountain, but it had not been constructed. So they would have gone without God, without, without the law, and without the, uh, <clears throat> without the tabernacle to be able to go. And Moses said, Lord, let's talk about this. Let's talk about it. And Moses, verse 7, used to take the tent, pitch it on the outside of the camp, some distance away, calling at the tent of meeting. And anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance of their tents, watching Moses head, until he entered the tent. And as Moses went to the tent, the pillar of cloud, that which they were following, would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. And whenever, whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they all stood and worshipped each at the entrance of his tent. And the Lord would speak to Moses face to face, as a man would speak with his friend. And then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Moses is going to tell them, I'm going to tell the Lord, I don't want to leave. And look at it, verse 12. And Moses said, You have been telling me, leave these people, but you have not let me know whom you will set, send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your way so that I may know, that, know you and continue to find favor in you. Remember that this nation is your people. In other words, Moses is saying, Lord, I was the one who left. And if you have found favor in me, will you show me your way? Will you show me the way to go? And just remember this. send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? Moses says, I'm not going unless you go with me. I have told people before, if Linda ever leaves me at my wife, I'm going with her. <laughs> and Moses is the same way. God, if you're not going with us, I'm not going with you. Verse 15 is a remarkable verse in chapter 33. Here's a different translation of 15 and 16. Then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and on your people, if you don't go with us. Then listen to this, for your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all the people on the earth. The presence of God, Moses said, sets us apart from everybody else on the earth. If your presence is not with us, if you're not leading and guiding in your presence, Lord, we're just like everybody else in this wicked world. And the Lord hears the plea of Moses. He hears his plea. And he sends Moses back up on the mountain to get the 
second copy of the Ten Commandments. He has them carve out the tablets. He goes back up, and God writes them again. They set up the tabernacle. They take up a big offering. They make the offering into a tabernacle for the Lord. At the end of chapter 40 of Exodus is the place where God shows his fourth key word, and that is perpetual. God is saying, I'm going to go with you. And he shows them he's going to go with them. Chapter 40, verse 34. Actually, 33. Then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and the altar and put up a curtain in the entrance of the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work. And then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travel of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, they set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. Verse 38. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle day by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel during all their travels. It was perpetual. It was ongoing. God was going to provide for them. And you know the last place that you see the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire that came at night, the last place you see that is when they arrived back at the edge of Canaan, about to go over in to Canaan. There's not any more report of a cloud that led them because they had now reached the promised land. After 40 years of wandering, they have more rebellion. See, we don't learn by one, one mistake. We often are people that want our own way, and they were the same way. And God punished them, and he says, you know what, because you have not been faithful in going over into the land that I brought you to, none of the men who are old enough are going to enter in. In fact, you're going to wander around this desert for 40 years, one day for every day that you sent someone in to spy on the land. And for 40 years, all the ones who are old enough and should have been faithful are going to die off, and your children are going in. You see, we sometimes think of God as a grandfather in the sky, or a loving, good old neighbor who's next door and you just love to be in his presence. God is a God who is worthy of our worship. He is a God who is to be reverenced. He is a God that is going to be one that we are to fall down and worship. In fact, one of the times when we were at Sinai, before they left, before they had rebelled, before they made the golden calf, God says, I'm going to speak to them from the mountain personally in three days. And he did. And the people cried out to Moses, Moses, tell God not to speak anymore because we're afraid just by the words that he is using, just by the sound of his voice that we're all going to perish. So let him talk to you and then you tell us because we for a holy and an awesome God. You see, God is continually with his people, even yet today. It's not through a cloud by day and a fire by night. Once Moses is at the promised land, we never hear about it. And God does not give his people a continual chain of miraculous signs he never has and he never will. Rather, he expects us to trust him for what he has already done, to search in the scripture and to live by faith and not by sight. So here's the application for you today. 
God will lead you and instruct you and direct you just as he led the children of Israel and Moses. And you might say, I would follow God if he gave me a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. To light my way, I would do that. Well, I've got a deal for you today. I have a deal for you because if you haven't bought one of these, you need one of these. And for $19.95, you can have one of these today. And in fact, I'll throw in two if you buy it today. <laughs> it is your own personal GPS. It is a cloud that leads you <laughs> by day and in the back and you turn around to a pillar of fire by night. <laughs> Two, it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> you see, if you have one of these, and God was saying, hey, all you have to do is follow the cloud, and you'll know the way. <laughs> if the cloud moves, then you do it. Right? <laughs> that would be easy, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know what? God has given us something that's even better than that. He's given us his word. His complete word. His word is complete. Not to be added to again. You won't find that you ever need to hear from God and God say to you, you know what? Let's add this to this passage so you understand it a little better. No. God has given us his word. And he says that this is a lamp to your feet and a light to your step. This is the lamp to your feet. And if you will follow me as you follow this, you will find your way. You know, the best way to know way, the way that God is going to, to lead you is to find it in God's Word. He speaks to you through His Word. And we so often neglect like that. He doesn't give us a cloud anymore. We don't need a cloud hat for a personal finder of the way. He's given us much better than that. He's given his son Jesus to die on the cross. That for everyone who would trust their lives with him, he would give them not only eternity in heaven, and not only forgiveness of sin, but he would give them his Holy Spirit that will never leave us and never forsake us. And he will lead us and direct us in the way that we're good. Good gifts. And you're evil. Let me tell you about it. 
spoke to me out of Galatians 1, 1, and in that verse, he spoke to me and called me into ministry. And I knew without a doubt, I was in fear. I like to, I like to associate myself with Moses because Moses didn't want to go, and I didn't want to be a fellow pastor. Moses said, who am I? And I said, who am I? And in fact, I remember asking God, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> That's my dear boy. You know what you're doing. And I remember going, waking up Linda a couple of hours later and telling her, and I remember going, telling my pastor the next morning, the next day. I remember Linda and I both going and telling my mom and dad and her mom and dad, wondering about how that was going to work because of some situations there. Thank you. 